It's now my honor to welcome a great friend, a leading citizen of Boston and of professional sports uh, around North America, uh, Jonathan Kraft, the president of the Kraft Group and chairman of the board of trustees of Mass General Hospital. Jonathan. Thanks, Chris. And thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. It's truly an honor to be with you. I love this forum. Uh, as chair of the board of trustees at Mass General, I have the opportunity to witness how our entire organization is transforming healthcare here in Boston and around the world. I also have a front row seat from which to view the profound advances being made by world leading companies in the life sciences and biopharmaceutical industry. Pfizer is undoubtedly one of these global juggernauts with a portfolio that includes medicines. And as we all know now, if we didn't know before vaccines, as well as so many of the world's best known consumer healthcare products. Uh, Pfizer is working across both the developed and emerging markets to advance wellness, prevention, treatment, and cures that challenge the most feared diseases of our time. And again, I think we all know that firsthand now. Their 170 years of history is marked by a commitment to collaborate and expand access to reliable and affordable healthcare around the world. We're delighted to have with us today Pfizer's Chief Scientific Officer and President of Worldwide Research, Development, and Medical, Dr. Michael Dolston. Michael is a member of the executive leadership, leadership team at Pfizer and the company's portfolio strategy and investment committees. Michael leads the worldwide research, development, and medical organization. And in that role, he's responsible for the development of all compounds through proof of concept and provides pharmaceutical sciences, safety, and medical support to the entire R&D pipeline and all of the marketed medicines and vaccines at Pfizer. Without question, Michael is an influential leader in the recent global vaccination efforts and is also a key developer of Pfizer's pursuit in gene therapy for numerous rare diseases. We are so honored to have Michael with us today for this discussion. And it is, uh, I now get to tell you that my really good friend and somebody who I admire greatly, Dr. Daniel Haber will be the one interviewing Michael. Uh, Daniel is the chair of the Mass General Cancer Center and he is also the Isselbacher Professor of Oncology at Harvard Medical School. His research is focused on understanding cancer genetics and associated targeted therapies. Please join me in welcoming Daniel and Michael. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this wonderful introduction and welcome, Michael. Um, this is a real pleasure and it'll be a very interesting discussion among the two of us. This is a conference on gene and cell therapy, but of course we should first start with a few questions on the Pfizer COVID vaccine. So let me first start, first of all, by on behalf of everybody in the world, thanking you, Michael and Pfizer, for saving the planet. Uh, it's a small thank you, but again, I don't know where we would be without you. So my first question is, where do we stand with the rollout of COVID vaccination, both in the US and across the world? And are you concerned about endemic sources of infection, reinfection, and the need for ongoing vaccinations into the future? Thank you very much for this kind invitation and, and for uh, Mr. Kraft for uh, saying those kind words about um, myself and Pfizer. So um, I think we have come pretty far in this uh, historical marathon that became almost like a sprint in developing this vaccine from um, starting the journey in first quarter 2020 and nine months later, um, mid December last year, getting the emergency use authorization. That's about six months ago. And since then, we have now been able to provide hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine um, across the globe. I think in US, we have uh, in general been um, now with uh, uh, the other mRNA company, the two main providers, um, both, I think, contributing in, in large proportions to uh, the vaccinated Americans. In Europe and other countries, I think we have had a leading capacity to deliver 
vaccines. So we are very pleased to see that um, in, in many countries, you start to reach uh, good numbers in vaccinated 30, 40% of the population. As we approach mid-year and early fall, I think in many places that will be reaching 60, 70% of the population. And somewhere between now and then, you should see a rapid fall in um, infections and hospitalization. We did actually have a very special real world evidence study with Israel, uh, given its um, size of around uh, 10 million people, its uh, well-defined borders and a healthcare system that was pretty centralized and all were digitalized. We were able to be the sole supplier of vaccines and follow through um, electronic registers uh, diagnosis of COVID illness, uh, various types, and even asymptomatic infections. And we were so pleased to see that the stunning results we had at the approval of the vaccine, about 95% efficacy, really replicated in real world. And we had somewhere between 95 to 98% efficacy on uh, various types of illness from mild, moderate to severe. And importantly, we had well above 90% protection also from asymptomatic disease. And why is that important? Well, we all have heard about uh, the PESC or what is called long COVID. Uh, it's, it's a new type of disease that can be pretty long-term disabling for patients. And it turns out that it's quite frequent e e e also in asymptomatic and mild disease. And particularly the mRNA vaccines have such a strong efficacy across the border of the disease spectrum. Um, so that's why I've been so pleased and uh, as a physician proud to see that we can help so many aspects of, of, of this difficult disease. Um, yeah. Thank you, Michael. I guess one question is we're talking about RNA vaccine technologies a week ago, or so the, the New York Times had a fantastic two-page write-up about all the complexity of how to make the Pfizer vaccine. So my question to you is, how did Pfizer first connect with BioNTech? And are there lessons about technical innovation and also how to manufacture and scale up something as complicated on a global scale? Yeah, uh, you know, we tend to say that there are thousands and actually tens of thousands of different steps in making this vaccine. And um, it clearly has been something we have been uh, working on for many years. But you also benefit a lot from being a very experienced vaccine company as analytical and purification methods and um, ability to manage sterile products in very large volume. So it is a very specialized skills and are, I would say, just a few manufacturing places across the globe that really can do it in a consistent, reliable manner. The good news is that we and others have been able to scale up. And just to mention our own experiences, when we um, were uh, finalizing our studies for uh, potential approval, we were planning to have up to uh, around a billion doses in 2021, we're now approaching a capacity of 3 billion doses this wow. year. And we see it within reach to go even beyond that to four and who knows, maybe more. So really cross the network that's now built up, I think there will be capacity to supply the entire globe. We just need to solve logistics together uh, across countries, getting access to raw material, export conditions and helping the lower income countries to have uh, uh, the experiences from some of the maybe more advanced healthcare organizations and how you deliver mass vaccination and do this effectively. Well, for us, we actually are one of the leaders in um, doing sterile injectable even before this pandemic. So we had experience to do up to a billion doses per year. So we could really build on that and uh, expand uh, quickly all the necessary steps but it was almost like you know driving a, a car while you are turning it in turning it from a gasoline to an electric car construction there were so many new things that we needed to readjust to refine to make this novel type of uh, uh, mRNA vaccine well we started actually three years ago in um, 
um, thinking about mRNA vaccine as a way to transform how we treat viral diseases. And uh, while we have been making a lot of progress, I would say in general, with the difficult bacterial diseases, such as uh, pneumococcal disease, um, if you take another difficult uh, airway disease, flu, uh, clearly the outcome of vaccinations were more modest. On average, between seasons, maybe 40 to 50 percent protection. So we embarked with uh, colleagues in Germany in a biotech company called BioNTech in putting together our skills, how to go from their experience working on mRNA in the cancer field uh, as a vaccine to our experience in the infectious diseases. And since many years actually working on gene-based uh, vectors, uh, whether adeno genome for cancer vaccines or AAV for um, uh, rare disease. So putting all of our experiences together, we did a, a lot of progress for flu, and we were leveraging that to do this very fast journey. And I really want to acknowledge, um, you know, so many contributors, not just inside the companies, regulators, great dialogues with the colleagues at NIH, and of course, the physician and patients that participated in our very large studies. So let's turn to cancer then. Is it an, R an RNA world forever? Have vaccinations changed forever? And how active is Pfizer now looking at anti-cancer vaccinations using RNA? Yeah, I, I think first of all, um, the data clearly shows that for viral diseases, this is likely the most potent platform available. And uh, we see, of course, now an opportunity to turn back to flu as, as we feel pretty good about how to deal with COVID, we need to keep an eye on COVID and think about like we do in flu to do boosting of our immunity, to keep high immune response and be able to fight off, not just the current um, SARS-CoV-2, but also viral mutants. We plan to be in human studies this year and probably quite soon with uh, a flu vaccine covering four different serotypes of, of flu. And we are planning to have a, se a second non-COVID vaccine also in clinical studies this year, also in the viral sector. And we think about building a very strong anti-infectious disease pipeline based on, on this platform. When it comes to cancer vaccines, uh, we have earlier been pursuing um, various approaches, including, as I mentioned, adenovirus that we thought could possibly be used for severe disease like cancer. We were less keen to use it for uh, infectious diseases that where you really vaccinate healthy people. And we also developed uh, vaccine yeah, oncolytic uh, based vaccines. Now the question you asked me, how can you leverage the mRNA experience? And that's exactly what we are discussing. We even had a conference today where we're looking at um, what are the learnings from translating preclinical to clinical and to real world experience with COVID that could help us how to better crack the code for success with cancer vaccines. As you know, the cancer vaccine area is a pretty complex place. And overall, I think the field has learned a lot, but so far not impacted as much as we have wanted outcome. Mm -hmm. In contrast, targeted agents for oncogenes, for cell cycle, proteins, and of course, recently, immune oncology approaches using antibodies have been much more impactful. So we hope to be putting together learnings from all of those areas and also make an impact working with, of course, academic leading investigators to be able to move into earlier cancer disease. And I just wanted to quote some of these discussions you and I had recently on the advance of liquid biopsies that allow you to possibly in a non-invasive manner identify uh, early cancers. And that may be a position where mRNA-based cancer vaccines may do much better. Oh, that's exciting. Let's, let's turn to cell therapies. You've, Pfizer has a, a major program in CAR-T and bispecific antibodies. What, what gets you the most excited looking at those kind of cell-based therapies for cancer and other diseases? Yeah, I, I think those uh, seem to be, you know, potent modalities. We started with um, CAR-T 
uh, and built jointly with um, another biotech uh, a platform internally starting about seven years ago and developed it into uh, early clinical studies. Uh, it was an allogeneic platform, which means we take cells from healthy donors and re-engineer them to be cancer-killing immune cells. As we expanded that platform, we felt that it was a bit of a boutique approach in, in the sense that you needed for every patient harvest um, cells and then distribute them to different cancer patients and was less fit with a mission for a company uh, like us that are expert in optimizing scale to treat many patients and to refine it. But we thought it was a very powerful technology for more specialized corporations. So we spun out um, a few years ago um, our capabilities and were very uh, appreciative as the former founders of Kite, one of the CAR-T pioneers for autologies, your own cells used for mm -hmm. CAR-T, joined us in that effort and created a company, Allogene, mm -hmm. that now has had significant progress uh, leveraging the strategy and capability we used, and of course, being able to focus entirely on this um, very potent, but also very tailored uh, modality. In contrast, we internally develop bispecific antibodies, which uh, fits very much with our long-standing experience in biologicals. Mm -hmm. And we are now in, um, ha have recently started uh, pivotal studies with and phase one with numerous of these agents across different indications. And I do think we'll see them to evolve and be an important contribution initially for blood cancers and hopefully also for solid cancers. Mm -hmm. And do that cross over as well into autoimmunity and inflammatory diseases? You're kind of getting into less tolerance for side effects than cancer, but very similar targets. Yeah, the, the bifunctional antibodies kind of hijacks a T cell and gives it a new specificity, uh, whether you're trying to kill a lymphoma, myeloma cell, or uh, an epithelial cancer cell. For autoimmune diseases, uh, we have been looking at uh, multifunctional antibodies that either can inhibit multiple immune mediators, cytokines, but you could, of course, consider whether you can re-engage regulatory cells um, that were supposed to be cells managing the tolerance between self and um, what is perceived as non-self in autoimmunity. And that may be a new field to evolve. It's a, indeed a very intriguing a cross-disciplinary exchange of knowledge between the, the immune oncology field and autoimmunity field. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that we should be able to apply many of those learnings. And what about delivery? Have you, have you developed or, or ex experimented with approaches to deliver nucleic acids other than just direct injection into muscle? Um, whether there are kind of delivery of antisense or other kind of nucleotides directly into areas of interest? Yeah, you know, traditionally our strengths has of course started with uh, where I think we are among world leaders in small molecules, large molecules and protein or conjugate based vaccines. And we see those disciplines of course becoming more sophisticated. You spoke to me about bifunctional antibodies we are now able to do small molecule that cannot just inhibit, but can signal and even degrade a target. When it comes to thinking on new modalities, so beyond mRNA, we do have collaborations with uh, biotechs, such as with Ionis, looking at um, uh, no novel antisense for uh, cardiometabolic disease. And uh, we also are looking at uh, a bigger effort for us is with um, delivering of DNAs using uh, AAV, which is adeno-associated viruses. And here we have built since seven, eight years, a really strong capability to do a material for research purpose, for clinical or for manufacturing to treat patients pending approval of a product. And in this space, we have now more than 10 programs, of which three are in late-stage clinical studies, reading out within one to two years and could possibly be 
approved pending a good progress within two years. So these are pretty near-term opportunities knocking on the door to be available to patients. Mm -hmm. Yes, we try really to uh, explore multiple of these modalities. And as we find where well, the biggest transformative opportunities, we double down. Mm -hmm. And for us, that right now is mRNA for vaccines and possibly therapeutic vaccination, as we spoke about, AAV to deliver DNA for curative effort, replacing of genes, and more targeted effort using antisense uh, and, and other uh, deliveries for cancer vaccines. So we started the conversation with the global challenge of COVID. Let me end with kind of a, a cosmic question as well. Is gene and cell therapy a first world therapeutic? Is it so complicated that you target it to our relatively wealthy nations where we can deal with this? Or how does, how does Pfizer deal with the challenge of such high-tech solutions for global health? You know, Dan, that's a very important question. And one of our uh, key values in the company is equity. And we look at ways in parallel as we develop um, a new product, how to make it available in an equitable manner. And, uh, you know, we have a tradition that um, while for the well-developed world like US and Europe, uh, our products are um, delivered at prices in line with the value and the innovation level, but for low-income countries, we uh, provide them for basically manufacturing price. So for us, it's, it's more about making sure we can scale up capacity as we get confidence in um, that we, we have a product that is effective and safe. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly like to see that we will be able to simplify even some of these new sophisticated treatments so that they can be available across the globe. That's part of our own efforts. And we work with organizations um, such as the Gates Organization in the United States, in Europe and globally, the organization like uh, COVAX and similar that uh, raise um, funds to be able to uh, help distribute into countries that may not even have the logistics. It's not just having the product, but the logistic to identify patients, diagnose them and develop treatment plans. So absolutely, we would like to break those barriers and contribute in a manner of equal access uh, to the globe. Thank you very much, Michael. We're, we're now out of time, so I want to thank you for a great fireside chat. We had everything except the fireside, um, but a wonderful discussion. And we're going to shift now to a Q&A. So thank you very much to our audience for joining us.